Nikola Tesla was a great inventor and uh, a great, great humanitarian. Well, Tesla wanted to get into his field, which was free, if you will, energy that comes from the surroundings. He was hired by um, J.P. Morgan to work with S uh, Westinghouse and Edison companies and, and in the East Coast. And Tesla said, I've, I've got it made. I think we can now transmit electrical power through the Earth through the ionosphere without any wires or, or telephone poles. If you gave a device, like a free energy device, a generator that would, would uh, service all their needs in their home for free, they could then bring out their creative talents, which they were born with and had been suppressed because they've had to toil for a living. They could be tremendous artists beyond beyond our dreams, tremendous engineers beyond our dreams. J.P. Morgan was not buying it. He said, no, we're going to have to tear this stuff down. So Tesla kind of pulled back into himself and decided, you know, well, I guess it's not time for this. And, well, at, at that time, he was living in the New Yorker Hotel, actually, in New York. And um, there was a fellow by the name of Otis Carr who he's going to school and to supplement his, his income, he worked as a clerk in this hotel. And uh, Tesla and him became acquainted. And Carr was a sponge. He loved science in every way, shape, or form. But he was a natural science. He believed in the same thing Tesla did, that there, there's no limits to natural science. And everything should be on a simple level. Tesla said, they're, they're not interested in my, my time. I want you to take everything I can teach you and go in your time and see if they'll listen to you. And if you don't make it, you're going to have to pass it on. Because at the rate we're going, we're on a self-destructive course. Carr said, I will, I will, and he, he got his own lab started and, and started uh, uh, really getting into a lot of free energy devices and building them. So he built a spaceship? Mm -hmm. He's building small spaceships then, and uh, he had different sizes, different models. So tell us how you met Otis Carr and how you began working with these flying saucers. There's a company, Advance Kinetics, in Costa Mesa. That's where we were living, in Costa Mesa, California. And they're looking for a research and development laboratory technician. They gave me a job, they put me in the research lab, and I was inventing ideas all day long. I just loved it because I, I like to invent simple ways of doing hard things. And was, you know, was Otis Carr working there too? No. I told some friends about, about, about this and what I was doing, and he said, well, come to our group. We've got a group here called Understanding. It was created by a, a gentleman by the name of Daniel Fry in California. We could talk about things that were unlimited, not limited. I said, my mission is to see that we have habitation and transportation in, in one vehicle. And he said, well, you, you sound like a guy that's back east getting in trouble right now. His name is Otis Carr. And he put in a patent for a levitation device, and they, they wouldn't give him the patent. They had to, he said, you've got to pull that levitation out and anchor it on the ground, and we'll give you a patent on an amusement device. You cannot use levitation. They brought him out to California. They said, here's your lab. They, it was all built. It had living quarters. It had, uh, you know, machine shops. It had. That's where you did most of your work, I That's imagine. And this is where you guys the... worked on the spaceship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How long did it take to develop this crap? Day and night, 24/7, we were building these small prototypes, and they would range anywhere from uh, 12 inches to three feet to six feet, to, you know, in in size. And they actually flew. They actually levitated. Oh yeah. Oh, and sure. What was the source of the power? Well, it was magnetic in nature. And, uh, and you were actually here. building these for people to sit in. I mean, not just models. These were, these were prototypes just to prove uh, what we wanted and then graduate up to where human habitation could, could get on board and, and, and operate them. If you could explain to us very simply how this device, how these craft work. In those days, yeah. we had counter-rotating wheels, one going clockwise and another going counterclockwise. We had a capacitor, we had small magnets, and um, we had what's called a utron. It was a double tetrahedron. That's two ice cream cones put with the open ends together so that you have a diamond shape. And we had 12 of them around the periphery of the craft. And we had magnets, horseshoe magnets, 12 of those around the craft. So when you started rotating and counter-rotating, the, as these utrons went through the field, they would act as, as a generator and a capacitor in, in themselves, and they would generate a lot of power, not necessary electrical power, but vibrational power. When you get to the resonant frequency of your surroundings, 
uh, it cancels everything out. It goes to a zero point. And once you've reached zero point, then you can go anywhere you want. And you're, you're, you have your own force field around the, the craft. control its up and down and left and right movements by how fast it spins or other gyros in there? Yeah, the ones with the models we had, we had uh, remotes, you know, to, to, to operate the models. But <clears throat> when, when you get up into the larger craft, it's not necessary because everything then, as Carr was explaining, the difference between the brain and the mind is synergetic. You operate the craft like it was a friend it's, it's like it was a living thing because you connect with the craft yes and and that's that's the only way that our particular craft would work there was a mental interface yes so it's wow kind of like yes. the thoughts carry out a vibration as well mm -hmm. and you have to mm -hmm. go in harmony with a ship so some sort of morphogenic field was created perhaps some sort of almost yes. living field yeah, absolutely ralph have you had a chance to fly it yourself Flying is an, an antiquated word when it comes to the type of spaceships that we were operating because they don't f conventionally fly. More they, levitate. they levitate and they teleport. They move through this thing called time and space. They actually traverse through multi dimensions. So you created an artificial gravity field, is it safe to say? Uh, yeah, you could say that, yeah. Is this in any way related to the work of John Hutchinson and his anti-gravity experiments? Well, it's along the same lines. And I know John, he's, he's an associate of our group. And as I mentioned before, there's all forms of levitation. But where ours differs from John's is that in order to operate our craft, it takes spirit, it takes, it takes a synergy. It, you have to recognize the craft as an entity of, of, of life itself. It has a consciousness, if you will, of its own. What John is doing is wonderful. I'm glad he's discovered a tremendous field of uh, levitation and, and the composition of, of metal and uh, manicular structures. Ralph, can you tell us about your experience as being the co-pilot of one of these discs? Sure. The next stage up was the 45-foot craft. It was, uh, they had already designed and built it, and uh, <clears throat> they wanted us to test it. So we got on board, and near the center of the craft was a, a giant crystal ball in a kind of a gyroscopic holder. Underneath that was a laser that came up through the bottom of this crystal. And as the light came up and dispersed around this crystal, it lit up the crystal from infrared all the way, way around to ultraviolet. Then then Carr said, okay guys, <clears throat> what I want you to do is just clear your brain and use your mind. So this is an experiment and we're going to go outside and back in through what's known as time and space. And all you have to do is concentrate on what I'm what I'm about to tell you. We're going to go down range 10 miles. And that 10 miles down range is equated to the vibratory rate of the color aquamarine. The colors just kind of dissolved and started turning into this brilliant aquamarine. And it lit up the whole ship. And then he said, okay, that's it, boys. Get out of the craft and we're going to debriefing. And we looked at each other like, oh, I don't think it worked. We didn't, you know, we didn't go anywhere. We didn't do anything. And we said, well, it didn't work, did it? They said, why don't you guys empty your pockets? And we started pulling out sticks and stones and grass and stuff and putting them on the table. And I know we didn't have those going in. And where in the heck did this come from? And he said, well, you remember I told you about the brain has a limited capacity. It cannot believe beyond its, its jurisdiction. It doesn't want to believe anything beyond that. So you travel with your mind, and, and it will come back to you, and then all these dots will be filled in as, as your life progresses. You'll remember what you did. It was in retrospect, <clears throat> I did go back now, and I do remember going and getting out of the craft. There was three of us. We walked down this ramp. We got out and we went over to a little hillside. I can see it right now. We picked up rocks and sticks, put them in our pockets, and we got back on board. I remember it now, but I didn't remember it then. It sounds like this technology 
is something that we have to be spiritually advanced enough to be yes. able to use it. And Carr explained that as higher consciousness. He said, you've got to raise the consciousness. When you were operating this disc, did you notice or were you told that anything changed as far as the structure of the craft? There's a consistent expansion and contraction. It's almost it's almost so instantaneous that it's unnoticeable. And in one of the smaller demonstrations, <clears throat> we had a, a small model. Uh, aluminum model and I could hear this hum and it was just a beautiful beautiful feeling while this thing was running and I was touching it and then it, it got it got more and more intense and then I found like it was jello and I could put my fingers on it like jello and I, I looked at the other guys and then I put my fingers inside this aluminum with my, my hand I said this is impossible when I'm doing this and I put it in in and out of the craft and Carr was over there because he said, yeah, they said, yeah, you're energy, and that's energy. And when you understand that and you, you get a harmonic with energy, you get a balance, you can do anything. There's no limit. So the next day, he had another model, and we put it up, but he was going to accelerate beyond. He says, these <clears throat> retinas are like cameras, are flashing at milliseconds. And when you flash fast enough, things seemingly disappear. So with that in mind, here's our next demonstration. So we fired this one up, and we were all watching it, and I was, I was getting ready to put my hand in it, and whew, the whole thing disappeared right in front of us. He said it's quite simple. Tesla did this all the time in his laboratory, and it's, it's uh, teleported. He said, well, where did it go? And he said, well, it might have landed on somebody's dining room table. I don't know, because I don't know yet where it went, and I don't know if it'll come back. Maybe it'll show up someday. Maybe it's gone. Maybe it's still there. But we just don't see it. So we don't see it, yeah. And we, it's out of our dimension. And he explained <clears throat> that the mind, when you get, when you tune yourself high enough and you get into the mind space instead of the brain space, instead of logic or instead of reasoning or instead of all those things, you just get up to a sense of knowing. You know who and what you are. That you're a creative, immortal, infinite being. And we all are. And he said, every, everybody on this planet is, is, are gods by comparison, and they don't know it. They're asleep. <laughs> and until they wake up, this is what our job is. We're making these toys, trying to get them to wake up, to realize there's no limits to what they can do. They don't have to live in servitude. They don't have to live in poverty. They've just been told that by people that uh, unfortunately want to control things. Carr explained to us <clears throat> that the brain that we have operates this water vessel which we live in. But the energy that inhabits the vessel is who and what we are. We are energy, we're not, we're not bodies. The energy is all magnetic in nature. It's free in nature. We're swimming in energy. Well, before we could get any further with it, we were uh, invaded, if you will, by um, people with a piece of paper that said, they were at this time closing us down. The paper read that we were attempting to overthrow the monetary system of the United States, and that could be construed as high treason, and we were shutting you down and confiscating all your equipment. Wait a minute. Didn't John Hutchison say the same thing about the Canadian government, that they confiscated his entire lab at one time? I stayed in touch with Carr as much as I could, but uh, as soon as I contacted him, I was contacted by somebody and we told you to stay away from even thinking about this. Well, what did the energy companies do to Carr? The uh, powers that be, uh, namely the power companies, weren't quite interested in anything that to do with Tesla or Carr. They didn't want this information out. It was even beyond the energy company. It was behind, it came down to, and it can be traced to this day, back to the international banking system out of England. That's where this all started, the monetary system per se. Because his inventions were so revolutionary, would it upset the whole banking system? <clears throat> yes, it would upset everything. They had a very, very uh, earnest effort put forth to, to eliminate Carr and his, and his inventions and his ideas.